our primary goal and what we hope to accomplish through these next eight weeks plus two um, is bring people into closer relationship with the Episcopal Church, a closer relationship with other members in the community, and deeper in faith through service to and on behalf of the community. So you'll see the words that I've got highlighted in there are relationship with community. The community is really kind of the focus for this morning. We're going to hear a lot of information over the course of this. And one thing I want to point out is we talk a lot about faith formation, Christmas, uh, Christian formation. And formation is not the same as receiving a lot of information. Formation is taking that information in and doing something with it. In fact, formation is probably not even the right word. The better word is transformation. Because transformation is what church is about. If we come to church without the expectation of being transformed in some way, I wonder why, why we're here. So transformation is probably the key word for this whole thing. When we think about the Bible, we think about liturgy, we think about the sacraments. It's all about transformation. And what do I mean by transformation? If we recall in the baptismal covenant, one of the promises that parents and godparents make to their child who's being baptized is to bring that child to the full stature of Christ. And that's the transformation. It doesn't happen by the time the child is confirmed. It's a lifelong process. So and it doesn't happen all at one time. So it's a step-by-step-by-step -by -step -by -step thing that we don't even know is happening most of the time. It's only when we look back that we see, aha, something actually did happen. So, again, transformation is really what we're after far more than receiving a lot of the information that we're going to be talking about. This is a chance to ask questions and voice doubts. Um, this church is often about voicing doubts and asking questions. We have one caveat. We are sandwiched in between the 8.30 service and the 10.30 service. In radio language, we've got a heartbreak. <laughs> and we get people to 10.30. So, um, with that in mind, um, uh, our time for questions and conversation may be limited, but um, I'm happy to give my email. Uh, I'd love to hear questions and uh, have a conversation. Um, oh, there we go. Plenty more chairs. So how do we do this? We learn something about where we've come from as an Episcopalian, some of our history, our roots in Anglicanism and the Church of England. And we'll talk about the Episcopal Church as it's separated from the Church of England in America. We'll talk about uh, the Bible. We'll talk about the Book of Common Prayer. We'll talk about the sacraments, baptism, the Eucharist, and the sacramental rites as well, um, marriage and confirmation and uh, care for the sick. Confirmation and ordination. And then we'll talk about the call to the mission. That's kind of an outline, and toward the end, we'll uh, look at an actual what we do week by week. So, becoming a member of the Episcopal Church, you can come into the Episcopal Church. Worship actively. You can engage in parish life. 
you can serve in certain capacities. You can even pledge. Does that make you a member of the church? Anybody? No, it doesn't. No. Not officially, anyway. You might feel like a member, and you're always welcome to stay there. Uh, baptism. Baptism makes you a member of, makes you a Christian. You've been baptized, you're a Christian forever. Okay, so that's the first level of membership. To be a member of the Episcopal Church, however, the baptism, especially if it's done as an infant or a child, has to be confirmed. So your membership through confirmation, and confirmation is accomplished by the bishop. Uh, the bishop will visit all the parishes at one time or another during the year. So the bishop comes, and upon confirmation, you are a member of the Episcopal Church. You are a member of a specific parish. So suppose you're not a cradle Episcopalian. You weren't born into it. Suppose you were Roman Catholic or Presbyterian or something like that. And you want to become an Episcopalian. In the same liturgy, uh, the bishop will receive you into the Episcopal Church. If you've been baptized in Trinitarian baptism in any any denomination, the Episcopal Church recognizes that baptism. So if you've been baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, that baptism is acceptable. You don't have to be rebaptized. If you've been confirmed in another denomination, that's acceptable as well. And that's why uh, coming in is, is a reception. Uh, reception into full membership in the church. And there's one other thing that takes place, or can take place, that even if you've touched all those bases, um, there may be times in your life, or there may be a time when you've fallen away from the church, you've gone away, and the Holy Spirit has moved and brought you back into the church. And you may want to reaffirm your faith. There may be lots of other occasions where something happens in your life and you say, this is time for me to make a public reaffirmation of my commitment to Christ. So those are the three things. That this is the extent of membership. Are there questions about that that come to mind? Community. Look at that word. We kind of all know what community means, but look at that word and see what's in that word that helps you understand what that word means. Community. Unity. 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 Commune. Commune. Common. Common. Thank you. Come. <coughs> Thank you. That's great. That's the one I haven't thought of. Communicate. Communicate. Excellent. Communicate. Yeah. We're, we're, so we're all on the same page of what the word community starts to mean. We see a oneness. We see a commonality, and we see communication. If we go to the dictionary, it'll say something like, a group of people share common characteristics or interests and perceived as or perceiving itself as, distinct in some respect from the larger society within which it exists. 
Does that make sense? So there's, there can be all sorts of communities, people with common interests that perceive themselves in some way separate from the larger community. Um, I think of the passage in, in Matthew where uh, Jesus starts out saying, who do you say that I am? And it ends up with, with Peter saying, you are the Messiah. And Jesus saying, Peter, you are the rock on which I will build my church. And I always wonder, what did Jesus mean when he said church? I mean, there was no church there. So if you look at the word that is translated as church, it's ecclesia. It's a Greek word, ecclesia. And what does ecclesia mean? Or what would it have meant to first century people? And what it meant was people that are called out. And in that context, it might have meant people that are elected to office, like the Roman Senate could have been thought of as an ecclesia. So by the time in the 14th, 15th, 16th century when this is all being translated into English, we're very familiar with church. So this word ecclesia can readily be thought of as church at that point. But in the first century, it's people who are called out. So even, even in the first century, we're thought of as people who are called out for a special purpose. So another definition of community, common definition, is ecclesiastical one, where a group of men and or women lead a common life according to a rule and I don't see Brother David Rutledge here anywhere, but if he was here, he's an example. He's, if you don't know David, he's, you'll see him in the brown uh, Franciscan habit. Um, and he's very commonly here, but not today. <laughs> he lives by a rule, a rule of life, a Franciscan rule that calls him to certain activities that he does daily, his prayer, his work. He is part of the brotherhood that, that does not live a cloistered life. The Franciscans, the Franciscans are not cloistered. Um, they're out in the world. Um, but he, and the idea of a rule of life, we can have our own rule of life. We can say, if you, if you remember, I don't know, um, Michael Kurt, our presiding bishop, has uh, authored The Way of Love. And we've talked about this here multiple times. How many of you remember us talking about Michael Curry's Way of Love? <coughs> well, he's got seven key words. Turn, learn, worship, pray, bless, rest, and go. And each of these words can be turned into a rule of life for ourselves, a personal rule of life that says, where am I in each of those aspects in my spiritual life? And if I know where I am, if it becomes intentional and conscious, I can say, okay, well, what's the next step? Where do I go from here? Because it's a spiritual journey that means we're moving along. So there's three essential ingredients um, in a community. You have to have members, and the members have to be in some sort of a relationship. And there has to be a mission, a purpose for the community. So here's a question for you. What makes a church community distinct from other communities? Thanks. 
Practices. 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 It's, it's people, but all communities are people. What's different about a church community? Shared beliefs and values. Shared beliefs and values. Shared beliefs and values. It's voluntary. It's voluntary? Yeah, absolutely. An interest in spiritual things and the divine. An interest in spiritual things and the divine, yes. Come together to worship together. We come together to worship together. Language. Language. What do you mean by language? That people can, that people understand each other's words. People do understand each other's words. Maybe they do. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder. <laughs> yeah, but they understand something by them, and they communicate that. Way. They do, and and it's it's actually a good point because in the Episcopal Church, we sort of have our own language. We have names for things that you hear said, and you say, what are you talking about? Um, the work of the Holy Spirit. Work of the Holy Spirit. Thank you. Um, that's probably the one that separates out a church community from other communities that we are conscious of of the Holy Spirit at work, not only in the community, but in everybody's life that's in the community. And we might even be conscious of the Holy Spirit working in people outside the community that they don't know it's working in their lives. Our liturgy is different. Our liturgy. Yeah, absolutely. Great. All right. What I'm hearing is a lot on relationship and community, which is kind of where we started, isn't it? So maybe that a lot of it is is, is just making it conscious, not not taking it for granted that what we see and, and what we feel being part of this community is, is um, needs to be brought to the forefront of our minds. It's not just a place we come every Sunday and we go home and live the rest of our life. I have some things here that I will offer. Um, what I've done with previous confirmation classes, and, and I especially encourage it for people who are actually here for confirmation or reception or reaffirmation of faith. Um, I will send out after each session an email of, of uh, different YouTube video clips relating to what we talked about uh, today, for instance. So I'm going to, uh, there, there's several of them, and if I, I would encourage you to give me your email, your name and email address. Um, you don't have to, but and and I don't have one for everybody, of course. But I'll spread these around, and you can just pass them from table to table. Um, pass one back to that table. Uh, if I have your email address, uh, I'll be happy to send that out. All right, moving right along. Let's look at some scripture passages about community before we uh, come to a close here. This is from Acts 2. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all people. Here's from Acts 4. All the believers were one in heart and mind. No one claimed that any of their possessions was their own, but they shared everything they had. Romans 12, uh, Paul instructs. Now, the first two were kind of a report. This is the way it was. But Paul is now instructing. Uh, live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud, but 
Be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited. Next week, we will talk about Christianity in England, Church of England, Anglicanism, and all that jazz. <laughs> and the week after that, we take a, a, a break because you will be introduced to the nominees for vestry. And then the week after that is annual meeting. So we won't do that week either. But when we resume the following week, we'll talk about the uh, Episcopal Church in America and how we moved from being Church of England through the American Revolution to being the Episcopal Church of the United States of America. If you were here last summer, you might recall we did a session on the Bible. Uh, we're going to do that again. And then we'll do a session on prayer and the Book of Common Prayer. The Book of Common Prayer is that red book in the pew in front of you that we never open. <laughs> we don't have to because everything is in the bulletin, so why do we? It's a thousand pages in the Book of Common Prayer. It's a lot of really great stuff in it um, that we don't perhaps pay enough attention to. So we're going to take a closer look at the Book of Common Prayer and prayer itself. Um, then in session six, uh, the sacraments, we'll start with baptism and we'll go, we talked a little bit about it today, we'll talk in more depth about baptism. And um, between that one and the next one where we talk about the Eucharist, we'll also include the five sacramental rites. And finally, on stewardship mission and spiritual gifts, which is kind of a bookend to this, because we get back to the notion of community and what it means to be in relationship with each other and with God. Um, so that's sort of the outlay, and that'll actually, believe it or not, take us into life. Uh, we'll be in life by the time we finish.